Hey, it's Terry, your favorite no bullshit artist and business coach. And you're listening to Terry Talks, where we discuss all things taboo, uncovering art industry nonsense, grounding you in confidence and leadership to run an arts business with unwavering power and grit. Hello, hello. This is uh, technically episode four. I uh, put out a survey uh, or a poll on Instagram probably last week that was asking you all what you wanted me to talk about next. I have so many different, I have like a crazy list of things that I want and have been wanting to discuss. Um, And so we're going to talk about leveraging the things that you have access to, leveraging all the things that are already in place that you might not be aware of, or you might not have, you know, taken advantage of the resource. Um, I want to start this off by saying that nothing is ever enough when you are first starting out. And I said what I said, it literally feels like you are stuck in the nothing zone. And I've learned over time that that I had to learn very quickly as a freelancer that that is just like not fucking true. Um, Yes, there are things at the moment where you're craving, you're in desperation, you are confused and lost and how are these people doing X, Y, and Z and imposter syndrome and how could I have left my job and so many other emotions force us into looking at the negative. And I mean like the deficit the scarcity, all that stuff. And I've completely been there multiple times throughout my career up until now. Um, It still feels like it's not enough. But what I do want to talk about is what you can absolutely leverage that is either free or low cost and for a reason. So, you know, a few things um, about me that you may or may not know from whether you're following me on Instagram or Facebook or you know me personally is that I can literally scour all of New York City to find anything and everything for free. And that includes whether it's a thing, um, a service, or literally you can name it and I can find it for free. I have found pretty much I want to say everything in my apartment except for the little coffee table that I am leaning on right now that was a gift. Every single thing in my apartment has been for free. Um, And it is just a hobby and a chase and a thrill. And it's also how I was raised. Um, you know, going to the Salvation Army as a very young girl was so much fun for me. My mom like instilled in this like hunter sort of characteristic and and sixth sense in my bones for finding a deal, finding something used that was still in incredible condition, right? There are so many things that are available. So let's, let's get right into it. When we talk about the way we're feeling when we first start, we're an emerging artist or we are in the beginning stages of really developing what you want your business to look like. Those ideas of, I need more money. I need more work to actually start selling, or I need to find my niche or my style before I put any work out there for sale. I need more followers, which is like a very common stereotypical thought process, right? And it can be a very, it can feel very real, right? The impact of not having enough followers, not having enough eyes, not enough is like the key term, right? You you get the idea here. And I need a gallery representation to get me somewhere. All of these things are on the list of what's what we don't have, right? Thinking in the negative. So I didn't have shit when I started actually Handmade in Brooklyn in 2015. I had jumped into action after being fired from a very long-term career of over a decade of being an art educator. A lot of you know this. And I jumped into action with what I had. Day one, filed for food stamps. Day two, filed for unemployment. Day three, filed for Medicaid. 
all of those things were my necessities, right? I dropped Spotify, stopped getting my hair done every four weeks, no nails. The luxuries were all of a sudden like not so important when you are actually leaning on the things you have access to. My focus was laser on what I could take advantage of. And that included government money. I had spent 15 years paying double taxes because I worked in Jersey and I lived in New York. I had spent, you know, years giving back. And so I had to minimize that shame when it came to food stamps, when it came to, you know, um, all of these resources that are available to low income you know, households. And I fell into that bracket when I did some research on, you know, what the person, like who gets um, these, uh, what's it called? These benefits. I was like, you know, I want to know, like, are they only single mothers? Are they only people who have lost their jobs? And there was like a huge percentage, like an insane percentage of people who were in the creative freelance or gig, um, or gig workers who were applying and collecting, you know, food stamps mainly because I had a lot of shame around that. I was not homeless. I was not dirt poor. I was definitely going to be in that space if I didn't get my shit together. And when I think about all of the artists out there and the DJs and the people who are in who are gig workers or people who are in, um, you know, working for minimum wage still at whatever, a cafe or, you know, whatever it is, you do qualify for these things. It's a matter of educating yourself in order to fill out the paperwork. They make the filling out the paperwork literally the hardest thing to do. And it's unfortunate because really the most educated people would have the least you know, um, problem actually or the, the, the lesser of the challenge to actually look at the paperwork and fill it out correctly. Right. Imagine you're an immigrant or imagine that you, that English is your second, third, like no language. Right. Um, and you cannot read the application in Chinese, English, or Spanish. You're screwed in many ways and people will get rejected very quickly because the people reading these applications are just like, they don't give a fuck, right? They want to look at an application, have it be clear. And that is the most intimidating part. So once I got those things cleared away, I felt like I had a safe space to be in to then think of my next steps. Okay, what else do I, what else can I leverage? Now I'm a researcher. I don't, I, nothing is going to stop me from getting on the internet and getting the answers that I actually need. So there is a level of like grit that you have to step right into very quickly to get these things done. Because for me, it was a, I didn't, ha I didn't feel like there was any other way. I knew that this was the life that I chose partially, right? I knew that maybe I was thrust into this before I was even ready, right? When you get laid off or when you get fired, it's not like you're, you know, depending on what the vibe is and what the situation is, you're not totally prepared. Now I happen to have a pretty good saving, but that was only going to last me so long. And when you are starting a business, you do want to uh, make some investments, right? And so the frugality of things was the most important part. I don't need to order out every night. I don't need a matcha from a cafe every night. And so I cut all my bills in half to the bare minimum so that I could prioritize where I wanted to make money, how I wanted to make money, and where how I wanted to use it. Okay, so I hope all of this is like making sense to you. And of course, if you're watching the replay, definitely ask me some questions. I will always be responding to you guys. I appreciate you even just listening to the Terry Talks podcast because it's a way that I can express some of these like back end BTS um, things that I've gone through firsthand. I know what it feels like to leave a very, very sturdy, steady job to like something that feels like it's in a disarray. Um, 
And so my mind goes into organization mode, right? And so what I did was I had $1,500 in order to open up a Chase business checkings. That was literally something, I, my grandfather was a lawyer, so he was very like strict on getting my shit together. I needed that 1500 in there, um, you know, as a requirement to keep that open. But it actually like, that was my first investment in myself in thinking very seriously about how I wanted to separate my bills and how I wanted my income to actually land where I wanted it to land. And so I was starting this entrepreneurial mindset already. And that made a huge difference in like where my mind was going. I looked for free trainings through every single organization that New York City has to offer. So I would go to the Brooklyn Library for their master classes. I signed up for um, free con like consultations with lawyers, with brand in, um, marketing experts that the city, the Small Business Administration in New York City actually offers. I did it all and I did not pay a dime. Yes, yeah, some were hit or miss, but of course you always pick up one or two things that will lead you to the next sort of the next step. And so I did all the free trainings. I got all of the mentorship that I needed through the Women's Business Administration. That is a subsector of the city. I, um, joined the freelancers union right away. I wanted to be in the know. There are discounts on the freelancers union websites. There are dental options, right? And of course, when I got Medicaid, I had all of that figured out. So that was a huge weight lifted off of my shoulders. I've never been one to not have insurance, period. Car insurance and life ins like physical body insurance. Like those are major for me. Um, I scoured the internet for any free workshops, whether it was the Women's Business Administration, the Brooklyn Library, um, NIFA, which is an incredible resource. And then of course, you know, I did all my research in terms of looking at what I, trying to figure out where my joy was, trying to figure out where my purpose was. What do I like? What do I not like? What collectives are out there that I can join? Well, at the time there weren't any that, reflected what I needed. So I created Handmade of Brooklyn, right? Off the bat, shit was free. I was facilitating every single meetup. I was giving it my all. I was collecting knowledge because it started out by me needing a community of answers. And we collectively were the human resources. So free, right? I just brought these women together and sort of went to each pop-up doing my research, looking at like, how do I want to set up my pop-up table with my artwork? How do I want, what looks the best? What looks the best as in, in terms of the marketing and pulling people in? How do people like to be talked to? My eyes were fucking peeled. It takes zero dollars to go out into the field and look and observe and pick up tips as to what you need to do and what you want to do, what you want to show up as, what your vision, like really clarifying your vision for yourself. And it's not about like, I've got to have all the answers, but it's like, I got to have a fucking head start. I got to get in this because there's people out there who are waiting to buy my stuff, right? That's the mindset that I was in. It was like a life or death situation for me in terms of there is no other option, right? This is it. Terry, make it, make this shit happen, right? There was no like, oh, well, I could go back to X, Y, and Z, or I could apply to another teaching job. It's not what I wanted, right? When you are, have, like, when you're headstrong on something, there is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And so, um, I looked for support systems that felt organic. And so when I created Handmaid in Brooklyn, that was like my family, meeting up with them once a month, talking about the shit we're going through, talking about ways to use social media at the time. This was 2015. Like it hadn't even blown up in that way. So we were still kind of Facebook-y, kind of in-person. Um, and we, I'd bring in guest experts that I would meet on Instagram or in person. We were collaborating with cafes that lent us free spaces after their hours. I mean, everything that I was doing was on the basis of people lending us things that would help us just to like 
touch base and be connected. Um, and that made such a difference in my life and in, and the members' lives, right? Eventually, I started charging a nominal fee just for my efforts and my work and also accountability, right? I started to put on my business hat and was like, ooh, I need to be bringing in money if I'm going to be working. And it became my job, right? I wasn't just a member anymore. I was more than a member. Um, and so... These things cost you nothing and leveraging getting your ass off the couch and actually walking into these places so that you can understand what what's involved in whatever you are eager to do um, is important. And I know that sometimes we're like, oh, I haven't gone to enough art shows, but like go to one a month right? You can still limit your space. You can still limit, you know, your responsibilities if you need to, but it really has to do with the block scheduling and making sure you know where you can be at any given time and that those times are sacred, right? That's what's in your control is how you utilize your time. Okay. Um, and so having the self-awareness to actually say, I need to get up, get off my couch and start some kind of a day, right? It doesn't have to be a regimented schedule. That's free, but that is on you to self-reflect and to be aware of like the pieces that are available to you, right? So if if there's first of the month um, at MoMA is free uh, because you haven't been able to afford a fucking, they've raised the prices to $30 now. That's absurd. That's not accessible, right? What is accessible is going on the first Fridays. Just letting you know, all right? So you've got some loopholes that you can work with. I'm very New York savvy. And I grew up um, in low income um, with, you know, the support of our grandparents, Um And I think that taught me how to be this way and taught me how to be super, super savvy and frugal with my money. Um, And therapy has been a backbone of my life, actually. It's literally my backbone. And it's what has guided me and allowed me to align myself with myself. Um, and that I am not splitting or I am not two separate people when I'm, you know, going through life. I am just me and I am aligned with my thoughts and I'm aligned with my heart. And when I'm not, I pause completely because that's what's in my control. And, um, the last thing would be to get a gig to gig or not. Uh, I find that when you, when an artist thinks about their gigs and their side, hustle, right? Because that really is just the chasing of money at that point for a cause. The cause would be in this case, or in my case, to maintain a fruitful career as an artist, as a freelancer, as a creative, as a coach or a mentor, right? At the time, I wasn't even thinking about coaching. I was out of the teacher world. I was out of the education world and desperate for some direction, Right. And when I think about side gigs, I think about something that is relatable to what I've already been doing. I think about what purpose it serves. Right. I remind myself that it is a means to the the goal, to the end. Um, And then I set boundaries around that. I do not babysit Mondays or Fridays. And then I I lessened that every single week. And then I put a minimum around my hours so that it would be worth my travel time. And then I raised my prices. Um, But it was all, there was a reason for the madness. And it, it was so important for me to be clear on what it meant to have a side job. Um... So when we're talking about all of this, I want to point you to the circle of control. If you are someone who has heard of this, um, there are three sections to the circle of control. What's inside is what you can physically control. The second concentric circle is your circle of influence, what you can change, what you can manage, what needs to be tweaked, the things that you can actually influence. And then the last concentric circle is what's out of your control. Fuck it. What's remove it, right? So I want to give you these three examples of what I mean in the artist mindset of what those three things would look like. So something that's out of your control is 
what other people think about your prices. That's number one. Something that you can you can control is making a fucking decision on what you want to price things at, okay? And tuning out the noise. And then what you can influence is the way that the industry is shifting um, money and the economy and how people shop and really doing your research and your um, like pricing research to see what the average would be of a piece of artwork that goes for um, X, Y, and Z, you know, looking at the prices and really thinking strategically about what makes the most sense. Pricing is not something that's completely subjective and it's not something that's completely objective. And this is like for another day and another episode, but these are the three things, like this is sort of an example when I hear clients come to me and they're like, but so I heard someone told me X, Y, and Z, or someone said I should raise my prices. It's like, number one, who's that person? Number two, does that matter? And number three, you know, then they should just go ahead and, and buy. It's a deal. It's a steal. Great. I'm glad. You know what I mean? And that influence of other people is just, like, there's just so many people these days who are giving unsolicited advice and it's like, at the end of the day, you're in full control of your own career. And um, I don't agree on basing my prices off of whether people think it's up or it's down or whatever the fuck it is. I've already done the research, the industry research to know where I fall, right? My prices are minimum $10,000 less than the average coach in the world. And that's on a very, very, very low end with like maybe one call a month or maybe just straight voice note access, right? Versus me providing a sliding scale on what I know where the artist industry is and where the artist financial kind of, uh, you know, um, barometer is versus the actual you know, retail price. And so, but that's my, that's my choice. That's my fucking choice. So I leverage the stuff that I have in front of me and I leverage my own motivation. And on certain days, I don't have that fucking motivation, but that's also within my control. And so, um, I I really like, I, this is a topic that I love so much only because I'm such a free, like, it gives me the biggest high to find something for free. Um, I manifest shit all the time when it comes to that. And I like literally the other day, my friend who's about to give birth was kind of like, I need more storage. I'm like, your apartment looks like a fucking hurricane hit it. I'm sorry. I love you. She's my first friend from high school, probably my longest friend at this point. And she was like, we don't have any storage. Well, somebody posted in one of my buy nothing groups Uh, They were moving out. They had like a set of these plastic drawers, three of them matching. And I went and go picked them up. And that was fucking it, you know. Um, So I highly suggest you join some Facebook groups. Um, I highly suggest that you take advantage of certain free courses that come your way. Not all of them are going to be great, but you're always going to pick up nuggets and gems of information that then you need to go and put into place. So I hope this was either a kicking your ass Terry talk. I hope this was either a very informative Terry talk on what you have access to. And I hope that this was a reminder that it does not have to be so challenging to actually get the shit started. You do not have to be a rich bitch in order to run a business. I guarantee you this because I am a full example of that. Um, Love you all. And if you have any questions, hop into my DMs. Make sure you sign up for my newsletter. I use email pretty um, consistently, but not crazy. So don't worry about being spammed. But um, it's really to give you exclusive email acts, like email opportunities only, um, give you time sensitive opportunities and information, and just like let you into a piece of my life on a different platform. So see you soon. <laughs>